Good morning, Circleville. How are you? Everybody have some good rain the last couple days? Yes, right. Uh, no severe weather in our area. That's good. Uh, anybody have any more limbs down? I asked last week, too, and nobody responded to me. Anybody have some limb wind damage? No? Still, everybody's doing good. That's awesome. A um, couple things. First off, um, I got a haircut, and I have um, not um, really been unhappy with a haircut before. And this one I wasn't too pleased with. And so if you see the back of it, I just had some people come up to me this morning and say, hey, did you get a haircut? I'm like, yeah. And they went, oh. So I totally understand. It does, oh, thank you, Norma. That was very nice of you. But just, you know, I'm the type of person, tell me if something looks off, okay? But um, anyway, uh, we're glad you guys are here. Uh, we got Jason Johnson uh, this morning. Jason, are you in here? Right over here from Manhattan Christian College, um, the traveler over across the country, um, is what he was telling me earlier, basically different spots and everything, that's awesome. So we're glad to have him here as a professor at MCC, uh, preaching this morning. Um, could I get the, I don't know if it's called the lawn uh, team, I think Mark's, Mark's in the back, if you, can you come in real quick, Mark? Um, who all is on our committee for lawn care and stuff like that for around the church? Uh, is Roberta here? Um, Roberta Spencer helps out a lot. I don't know if you guys have noticed the backside here and then the back 40 with how good the grass has been looking. A lot of that has been Roberta's hard work. Um, she's been seeding and watering and cutting and everything like that. She brings all her own equipment over and does all that. So uh, if you see Mark, uh, myself is on that committee and Roberta. Um, I think the Olberdings are on it as well, Val and Kevin. And so if am I missing anybody else? Um, if you want to help out this summer with weed eating um, or trimming or something like that, cutting the grass, please let Mark Fenton know. Um, he'd be the person to, to get a hold of. And then the other one was the maintenance committee. Um, I think, go ahead, stand up, Bill. Bill and Travis are on that. Yeah, go ahead and give them a round of applause. They do a lot around here. Um, Another area you guys could serve, um, if you guys feel like you uh, are handy or you have some downtime you want to pass the time by, contact Bill or Travis. I'm sure there's plenty of projects, even if you need to charge the, the scissor lift batteries for us so we can use it. Um, that'd be great. So, all right, thanks, guys. A um, couple more announcements. We got VBS uh, coming up this summer. Um, we still need volunteers for that. I accidentally skipped that last week, uh, but volunteers are still needed. If you want to give a lesson, um, that's a really big part of VBS for the lesson time. If you want to help cook food, activities, uh, sign-up sheets in the back foyer. And then tonight, I think, is, yeah, the midweek senior celebration at 6 here at the church. Um, Angie, any, any specifics that you want to mention about that? Awesome. So eighth graders going into high school, seniors are leaving, and then the encouragement of the junior high or juniors as well. And the meal's free, right? Okay, it's free. If that doesn't get you here, I don't know what will. Um, May 11th is the last week of the Merge Midweek Kids Club finished up this past Wednesday. Uh, Alicia or anybody want to make any comment about how Kids Club went? Okay, come on up, honey. Yep, because nobody else is volunteering, so you need to come up really quick. Or, or, or just talk right there. <laughs> Who all helps with uh, the kids' club? Could you stand really quick with Alicia? I need a link. Can we give them a round of applause for helping out with the kids' club? That's really awesome to see, you know, the bus bringing kids or the kids coming right after school, so it's really nice to see. And then the, obviously Angie and her entire team that helps out with Merge Midweek, Luke Schreiber, Emma, and, and everybody. I'm sure I'm missing plenty of people, but um, our youth program is doing really awesome right now. We encourage you guys at home, uh, welcome uh, to Circle of a Christian. We encourage your kids to come on Wednesdays, but you've only got a couple weeks left if you're in high school. So uh, we'll break for the summer. With that, um, if you guys would all uh, stand with us this morning, I'm going to pray. And uh, we'll get everything started this morning. 
Uh, Father God, we just thank you so much for who you are, what you do, um, and the the weather you've been giving us, God. We needed rain, Lord, and you provided. Um, God, we thank you for protection um, when we need it the most. And God, even when we don't think we need it, God, you're still there. Lord, we just uh, ask that as, as James brings a message this morning, or Jason brings a message this morning, God, that we uh, uh, have open hearts, open minds as the worship team leads us in song. God, I just pray that uh, we, we can sing our praises to you this morning. Uh, Lord, we just love you, and we thank you for everything that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And in Psalm, it says, Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us, none can compare with you. Were I to speak to tell your deeds, they would too many to declare. another this morning.
Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all the stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus.
conquer death. We believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back again. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back again, we believe. We believe. We Good morning, everybody. I sound about 10 feet thicker when I hold it right up here. Uh, this morning's meditation is about arranged marriages. We each have an arranged marriage in our future. But as funny as arranged marriages sounds to our culture, Arranged marriages are a tradition still in many parts of the world, like in India. Now, you may think that this is, arranged marriages is a recipe for disaster. But actually, in India, where they have arranged marriage, only 1% of married couples get divorced, compared to about 50% here. We also see arranged marriages in the Bible. You may remember the story of Isaac and Rebecca from Genesis chapter 24. Abraham sent his servant, Eliezer, to find a wife for Isaac. As Eliezer stood by the well, he prayed that God would make his choice of a wife apparent to him by having her agree to get Eliezer and his camels a drink from the well. God places a high premium on marriage, so it should be no surprise to any of us of his, seeing his hand in selecting marriage partners. Just as Abraham, the father, sent Eliezer, his servant, to find a bride for Isaac, God sent his servant, the Holy Spirit, to find a bride for his son, us. As Isaac waited in the promised land for Rebekah to arrive, Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father, waiting for our reunion with him. In Revelations chapter 19, verses 7, 8, and 9, the scripture tells us, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Until our wedding comes back, the bridegroom has left us the gift of these communion emblems, the bread that represents his body that was sacrificed, the cup representing his blood that was shed for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven. Let us then make ourselves ready for the marriage by living a life worthy of the sacrifice that Jesus made. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to the communion table this morning. We bring the things that affect us most, Father, the things that stand in the way of this wedding that is to come. For me, it's fear. 
fear of this and that and keeping that out of my way. I know everyone in this room, Father, has something to lay at the foot of the cross. We ask your guidance. We ask your wisdom, Father. Mostly, keep us in the light. Keep us on the path. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's pray now for our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the gifts that are about to become a part of your mission here in Circleville, Kansas. Father, help us to use these gifts 
to further your mission and to reach as many people as we possibly can, both here in our church and at home watching us right now. Father, we ask your blessing on these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we have Jason Johnson here to bring the message, something he did for 20, 25 years before becoming a professor at Manhattan Christian College, where he teaches ministry now. So please welcome Jason Johnson. Oh, oh, sir. Hey, good to be here. I've heard a lot of really good things about Circleville. So it's a joy to, to finally be here with you. I do get to teach uh, students at Manhattan Christian College, and it's a joy, and they, they bring life, and are, you know, a lot of them are going into different areas in our world, in a very complex world, to uh, spread the message of Jesus. And so please be praying for them as they prepare for that. My wife and I are in our 27th year of marriage, and we have a senior in college and a sophomore in high school. And I... I brought some bad news this morning. Not really, but uh, think about the power that those words have, right? Especially in the right setting. It's one thing if you're with some friends 
and uh, it's a lighthearted situation, and someone says, hey, I've got some good news and some bad news. Which do you want first? Well, you're probably going to be expecting a really good dad joke. But in other settings, in different contexts, when someone says, I've got some bad news. We can usually even feel our bodies kind of tighten up and we might even kind of shift our posture just a little bit, almost ready to brace ourselves for whatever it is. And, and, and many times we even have an idea of what that bad news, news is going to be. If you've been a, in a season of difficulty, that phrase, I've got some bad news, can be really hard. But the opposite of that is also true. If you've been in that really difficult season and someone says, hey, I've, I've, got, I've got some, some good news. Or even their posture of delivery is so much different than that other posture of delivery. <laughs> Doesn't it just seem like our world needs some good news? Yeah. Um, there's an inscription. It's a fascinating inscription that uh, is in the ancient world. Let me just read part of it for you, and then we'll look at a picture of it. But here's a portion of what it says. It says, Sending Him as a Savior, both for us and for our descendants, that He might end war and arrange all things. The birthday of the God for the world, the beginning of the good tidings, the good news through Him. Here's a picture of it. It's called the, the Preen Inscription. And it's from 9 B.C. And it's just a, a stone tablet and it's got a writing in Greek on it. And so I guess people have, throughout the ages, longed for good news, right? They've wanted some, some hope. And the, scripture, the in, inscription references someone who is going to bring that good news to a, a broken world. This person, this person that is coming is going to bring order and they're going to be, bring uh, order to all the chaos that we're experiencing. And what a message, what a good message for a world in turmoil, for a world that is experiencing political and uh, social distress, for a world where anxiety is skyrocketing. It's, uh, it's difficult. It's in difficult times. We uh, often look to someone to uh, lead us just like this inscription points out there's going to be someone that leads us through these difficult times and as a christian we might look at this inscription and go well that's it. that's talking about jesus there's too many there's too many giveaways in it it mentions good news it mentions the son of a god it, it's got to be jesus it's actually talking about octavian augustus the roman emperor he was the grand nephew of julius caesar and he allowed himself to be worshipped as a god, you know, thought he was a god. And there are even some inscriptions that he uh, is described as the son of God, as the son of the eternal Caesar. And Augusta, Augustus is credited to ushering in this era in Roman history called the, the Pax Romana, this period of peace, a 200-year period of peace. Here's the, here's the full inscription. If we want to read it. <clears throat> and uh, he says, and since Caesar by his appearance surpassed the hopes of all of those who received the good tidings, not only those who were benefactors before him, but even those who will be left afterward. And the birthday of the God was for the world, the beginning of the good tidings through him. It's a pretty fascinating inscription. Oftentimes in the, in the ancient world, that term good news pops up. It was used in reference to uh, military and political victories. Uh, the, the herald, the messenger, would actually be the one that would come back from the battlefield bringing good news. Bringing the good news from the battlefield. And so if we go back in time before this calendar inscription, we find that uh, the good news, when the Bible uses that word good news, that it's talking about this in breaking of God's kingdom into the world. And Isaiah uses a lot of this type of language. In Isaiah 52, uh, 7, 
we see that this messenger is coming back and it says how beautiful, very familiar passage to us, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes to proclaim something that is, that is heard. Peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And so uh, picture this scene that there's a the, uh, the battlefield and this messenger is coming back and the messenger is saying, hey, there's good news. There's good. I've got good news for everyone. We do it today. After a, a woman has carried a baby for nine months. And there's that birth and there's all the, the stats of the baby. And there's a little card that goes out that says, hey, everyone. On this date, so-and-so was born. They're this long and they weighed this much. And hopefully there's a little note that says, mother and baby are doing well. It's a, a published act. That's not when it happened, when that little card goes out. But it's a proclamation. It's a messen, messenger almost saying, hey, this happened, and guess what? Because this happened on this day at this time, everyone around this little circle around this baby child, their world is now changed. And first-time parents, you know, they have no idea the amount of change that they just entered into, and there's no going back, right? But everyone's world is now changed because of this one minute that this baby came into the world. In the ancient Near East, there would be that messenger announcing the uh, good news from the battlefront. And they would, by the time they made it back to the town, right? The victory had already been won. That was a past event. And now they're coming back and they're saying, hey, 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 guess what? Good news. In reality, the people in that town, they had already experienced the benefits of what had happened in the battlefield. This past event now had ongoing ramifications. Interesting thing, when we look at someone like Augustus, by his time, this spoken word, this message, was kind of intertwined with the content of it. And so uh, people thought that Augustus was the message of good news. You can see it in that inscription that it wasn't that Augustus was only bringing good news, it was that he was good news. That the, the message, the content and the message and the person, they were completely intertwined. He, Augustus, was good news. And by proclaiming the good news of Augustus, then it comes into effect. It's been published. It's inaugurated. But... But have you noticed the problem with that? It, not trying to trick you, right? I have some, I guess, some bad news for you. Um, for those of us who come after Octavian Augustus, which is all of us, we have a pretty solid case that he didn't do that, right? If we fast forward to some decades after this calendar inscription and, and after the the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have this gospel writer named Mark. And Mark pins this letter. And his audience is, um, was Greek. Their primary reference was this Roman Empire, Greco-Roman world. And look what Mark does. It's, 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 it's quite fascinating. It's extremely bold. Okay, look what, look what Mark does. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, if you, if you flip to uh, some of the other um, gospels, uh, Matthew, Luke, John. John has a similar beginning. But Matthew and Luke are uh, focused on the, the birth of Christ. And, and Mark comes right out of the gate. And he says, hey, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now let's look at it with the, the calendar inscription. 
Isn't that funny? It, it's almost, I, I like to think that, that Mark intentionally, he knew of this, he knew of the, the, the framework of thinking, and Mark said, all right, let's go. Here it is. Here is actually what good news is. A very bold and kind of in your face. One uh, commentator says it would have been difficult, maybe even impossible for Mark's audience, the readers of this gospel, to uh, open this without thinking that Jesus was an alternative to Caesar. Right there in verse 1. No, you've, you've grown up in this world where Caesar was good news. And uh, guess what? In verse 1 of my letter, I'm here to tell you, there's an alternative. That's what the rest of my letter is about. All but two paragraphs of the book of Mark are centered on Jesus Christ. Jesus is the good news that is coming into this world. And for Mark, it's this uh, momentous occasion. In the beginning, this new creation is at hand. And he quickly moves in to uh, the true, about the, the true good news, the true Son of God and Jesus. And then Mark brings us to this idea of a herald. Right away in verse 2, a messenger that is coming. And Mark does this uh, weaving of three Old Testament passages, passages together, the, the primary one being Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And he, and he connects to his Roman audience, and he says, hey, I'm, I'm crafting this uh, messenger piece. And if the prophet Isaiah um, uses good news to speak of the inbreaking of God's kingdom, well, guess what? When Jesus arrived, it was the inbreaking of God's kingdom. And uh, it's the final saving act. It's the, uh, the peace and the hope that we've been longing for. And in a, in a way, Mark is emphatically saying, Jesus has come into the world and now all the rules have changed. All the rules that we kind of know as human beings, all those have changed. If we, if we live in obedience with Jesus, then we experience His rule and His reign right now, today. Jesus is the manifestation of the, the good news. Uh, God's rule and His reign are a present reality for us, uh, for, for uh, those that uh, put their confidence and trust in Jesus. Interestingly, every time this word good news, it's also the word for gospel, Every time this word is mentioned in the Greco-Roman world, it's always mentioned in the plural. And guess what? <laughs> when Mark uses it in chapter 1, it's in the singular. There's one. This, this is actually it. Jesus is it. But, he, but here's the tension that we live in. Couldn't we say the same thing about Jesus' is good news that we said about Octavian Augustus' good news. It didn't work. Right? There's disorder. There's chaos. There's still hate in the world. Followers of Jesus get laid off. Followers of Jesus get that phone call that a loved one has passed away. Followers of Jesus still get the diagnosis. They still deal with the brokenness of this world. And in fact, everyone else does too. If we skip ahead just a little bit in Mark 1, to verses 14 and 15. Mark says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. 
the way that Jesus constructs that sentence, by using the word at hand, he is making a reference to two different aspects of the kingdom. It is now and it is not yet. It's really quite amazing as you study it because Jesus is saying that, saying this at the beginning of his ministry. He's not saying this post resurrection. That's a pretty big deal. He is saying that uh, my, my rule is now. And often, as American Christians, we think that God's rule is something very futuristic that it occurs in heaven. That's not what Jesus says. He says, my rule and reign exist right now. Not future, but now. The kingdom of God, when I was born, the, the kingdom of God busted into this world. And now the world work, works completely differently than it did. The kingdom of God, the way that Jesus phrases this, the kingdom of God manifested itself at his birth. And uh, there's a new state of affairs. It has been published that now things are different. The good news of Jesus' kingdom is that by putting our confidence in him, we live in his kingdom. And, and that yes, our sins are forgiven. But that's really just a small part. We get to experience all the rights and benefits as a son or daughter of his living within his kingdom. His kingdom, whatever the broken world throws at us, his kingdom is a very safe place to live. I know, that's hard. When the, when the broken world intrudes upon our lives and, and hurts and damages us. But when we live as citizens in His kingdom, it is a perfectly safe place. We experience care and provision that no one else could provide when we experience the, the bad news that is given to us, we also experience hope and joy and peace and grace and forgiveness and comfort because there's this new era that is now in existence. The amazing thing about Jesus changing the rules is that as a, as a person who has put their confidence in Him, we can actually truly from the heart forgive those who have wronged us. Wow. You serious? I, I, we don't have the time today, but I've been in ministry a long time and so I could go through a list of people. They're all Christians that have, that have really damaged me or my family. Usually by rumors and gossip. You mean I can forgive them? Yeah. I actually forgive them from my heart. And I actually pray today that God would bless them abundantly in whatever they're doing. Because of these new rules that Jesus initiated, we can pursue His will for our life and not our own. And that's actually the best possibility. His his will for our life is actually the best route for us to take. And, and oftentimes it kind of, you know, we kind of bump up against his will and we're like, eh, Jesus, I really think this is the better way. But if we submit to that, then um, ultimately we find out, ah, wow, I'm sorry, Jesus. I, th I, th I really thought at the time that my way was going to be better. Um, please forgive me because now it, now it's very clear that your way is the best.
Augustus advanced his kingdom with the structures and the systems in place, that power and domination and war and hate. And here comes Jesus ushering in a completely new era. And he reverses. He reverses every single structure and system of our world. And he says, no, it's not domination and power and war and hate. It's actually love, forgiveness, service. Jesus was so crazy as to say the first, the last will be first. And love your enemy. And in some of those days and months and years, and, and I know a, a congregation the size that there's there's people all across the spectrum. Some of us have been living with days or months of years of bad news. Those are also the times that I think that if we turn our hearts and our minds to Jesus, that we draw the closest to Him. I, I know that's been my experience, that the, the darkest times have been times that I wouldn't trade for anything because I had nowhere else to go. All I could do was depend and cry out to Jesus for His mercy. We've, we've experienced His peace. We've experienced His guidance. Our trust in Him has grown exponentially. We grew to love the idea that uh, this world is actually not our home. We're just passerbys. We're just aliens in this world. We're, we're not really planted here. We're just kind of going through. And I, that idea even brings comfort and peace and joy. But we also know that His kingdom is not yet. Jesus instructed us to pray for His kingdom to come. And so, as I've, I've gotten older, I've, I have a deeper, a much deeper longing for His kingdom to come to a completion. And I look around at all the things in the world that are wrong and broken. And a lot of days, my prayer is just, Jesus, bring Your kingdom to completion. And there will be a day that He restores and redeems all things. And we wait and we trust for that day to come. Isn't that kind of where we land? It's not, not trite and, it, and it's not trivial. We trust Him now. And we, we ask for Him to grow us in that trust almost on a daily basis. And then we trust Him for what will come. It's really our prayer. We trust Him now, and, and Lord Jesus, help me, help me trust You more every day. And Lord, I trust You. I trust You for what, what You're doing. And I trust You for Your kingdom to come to a completion. One of my favorite uh, ancient writers, about the 1500s or so, he says this, here's a way to know if you've actually trusted God with something. You will not think about the matter any longer. <laughs> right? Nor will you feel a lack of peace. Lord, there are many hearts here that are struggling with something. Could be something really big. Could be something that to that person is really big. And so I think our prayer today is help us to trust you more. Wherever we're at in that spectrum of, of trust and confidence in you may today be a, a point in time that we just cry out to you and and however we word that we just ask that you help us to trust you more 
Lord, you are, you are good. You have our best interest at heart. You love us. And even in that prayer, we trust that you will work in each of us to grow our trust and our dependence in you. We thank you. Thank you for your mercy. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Stand and sing with us. And before we start singing, um, I would like to recognize these girls. You might have noticed that like half of our normal worship team is missing. And these girls stepped up. Um, Clara Wills playing guitar and singing and Laramie Self is singing for the first time. And Annie has done it before, but they all have done awesome. So please give them some encouragement. Have a great weekend.